everybody how's it going um in today's video here's what i want to cover in terms of where we're at so far with the economy how does that affect e-com and in, in the space as a whole and ultimately the clients and the brand owners that are in the space right competing with one another to get profitable results on the space right so uh with that being said i made this twitter post uh earlier this morning and i just want to break that down to a t right so um in terms of what i talked about here not every e-com brand can be scaled this is just from my personal experience working with six figure brands doing six figs a month doing working with five figure brands doing like 30k a month in revenue so um the biggest thing so far that separates a well client from a smaller client is more so uh, i would i would have to say the steps and processes that i'm about to mention here but mainly starts with market validation even stems from like number of creatives utility competing with Amazon and having like an omnipresence in terms of ads, right? Uh, in the ad space. So um, with that being said, here's mainly what I want to cover. Working with brands with lower budgets, lower amounts of revenue, it mainly stems from market validation, right? The way the economy is just rolling right now, you cannot scale trending products for long. In terms of longevity wise, it's very difficult to maintain and, and have a consistent I don't know, return on ad spend while increasing the revenue at scale just because it's a trend. It doesn't provide any utility. People are not uh, purchasing the product over and over again, and there's not a subscription-based model, right? So what that means, and ultimately how does that affect somebody who's on a smaller scale compared to the bigger clients, right? All comes down to market validation, right? If you, if you have a product that does provide utility in a specific niche, Let's say if you're in the fashion space and you provide a product that is constantly reused or it provides some sort of utility in, let's say it's a, for like blue collar jobs, right? People are constantly buying these products because it helps them with their work. Then that's something that solves a problem. And with the economy, the everything, how everything's just crashing down, people are still going to buy that product compared to a trend or a game that just, or like a, like a, a product that has something revolved around a trend doesn't have any really consistent value in the market in terms of trends i'm talking about like socks or like trends i see like these um there's these like shark flip-flops and literally everybody's just drop shipping them like i'll t I guarantee it within a month or a month and a half from now everybody it's, it's product saturated right just because it's so competitive a lot of people are just reusing and re repeating the cycle so with everything happening it all comes down to market validation, providing utility in a specific niche. That's the main point right here, right? You have a brand, uh, like let's say a six figure brand, they have a product that is constantly reused or people are buying it in masses because if there's still a need for it, even though everybody's kind of pulling back their spin compared to a product that's on a trending basis, the utility and the amount of volume from that's gonna decrease because a lot of people are saving their money just based on the economy. Second is the number of creatives. What I've noticed is with bigger brands, more budget, they can allocate that for the number of creatives, right? In this new age of marketing, UGC is the name of the game. Bigger brands with bigger budgets have more freedom to invest into their creative pipeline to get consistent inflow of content over and over again to reuse for, for ads. Smaller brands don't have that leeway because they lack capital. They lack um, the ability to invest back into their business because they're just on a smaller scale, right? So that's what I've noticed in terms of content and on TikTok, click through rate is the most important aspect of it in terms of who goes when they see when somebody or stranger or random person comes across your ad, they click through that to see the next step and click on the website, right? In terms of click through rate, you're not off the bat, you're not going to have like a, a booming click through rate. You may or may not, it just depends on the product, depends on the brand, and depends on the style of content you're utilizing, right? Because we want to make sure content is native to the platform, but also we have some sort of structure, but that doesn't guarantee you're going to have a high click through rate, right? Just because um, the way I like to combat that is the more content we have, the higher chance of us hitting a, a click through rate on one of those creatives, if that makes sense. So typically when we sign on a bigger client, right, we recommend 30 pieces of UGC a month for each piece of content we make. That content is very different from the next side of content. These are 30 complete different new creatives. And then from there we see, okay, which content, what style of content 
got the best results. And then we build on top of those winners, if that makes sense. So then cycling through, all right, if this already worked for us, we're achieving a click-through rate above the 2 to 3% mark. Then we create more content around that compared to content that is launched and we're only getting a click-through rate below like at 1% or, or lower, right? Then we know, okay, this type of content didn't resonate with, uh, with the audience. What do we need to do to change that and get better results, right? So in this new age of marketing, the more content you have, the more creatives you're utilizing with different variations on top of that, well, then the higher chance your click-through rate is going to have overall when you're targeting at mass and targeting at scale. Thirdly, when I talked about this, I mentioned utility, right? So in the game of business, more money is made from reoccurring buyers than those new buyers. For example, you have downsells, you can have upsells, you can have like a value ladder to where somebody buys this product, they need a subscription, they have the subscription or subscription cycling within every three months, or even the higher the value ladder, right? If they, somebody buys this one product and then they can a discount at the next value or whatever they're in terms of if they buy more than one product, they get some sort of incentive to increase the average order value. Or even like uh, that's just the process of upsells in the value ladder, right? People get more when they buy in bulk, right? Or even downsells in terms of if you have like an email list and you're marketing to those people, let's say you're releasing some new product at a lower price or, and you can have that as a downsell, right? So if we already have p customers going through the pipeline. They've already purchased a specific product, right? It's very easy to get them to purchase another product than it is to go and find somebody who doesn't know anything about the brand and making conversion, right? Most of the money is made off of our current customer base, right? In terms of e -com. that's how you go about 10 X in your results. And I don't mean to sound like uh, crank our don't crank Cardone here, but um, yeah, literally reutilizing your customer base and taking getting the most out of your customer base is so much easier than trying to acquire new customers. So that makes sense, right? Because you already have a set base they're already familiar with your brand getting them to purchase more products or buy off of a subscription model is super easier than just going and, and constantly just cycling through where one person buys a product and then the lifetime value of a customer just diminishes because they just buy it once and they just leave and go to the next thing, right? Um, the next step for e -com is every e -com brand owner is competing with Amazon, right? I know every entrepreneur, they look up to Bezos, they look up to um, what Amazon is, right? But in the e -com game, we're competing with faster shipping times, Amazon has guarantees. Amazon offers irresistible offers, right? So if we follow those frameworks and improve the shipping times, we sh we include guarantees, right? That's uh, more so focused on the customer experience and also have irresistible, irresistible offers to go on top of that. Well, then when we focus on those small, minute details, that has a bigger picture in the long run because if we're more efficient and we're trying to compete with Amazon, the likelihood of us competing every other e-com brand owner in the space by providing all of these sectors is going to increase the results and increase the overall lifetime value of a customer because they're, they're being taken care of, right? So we have Amazon at the, at the highest point here, right? If we focus on our trajectory and getting to that point, well, in the end, if we're competing with other e-com brand owners, right, we're actually going to blow them out the water because we're trying to obtain a standard that Bezos has set, right? And on our end, it's very difficult in terms of, of shipping times, guarantees, irres irresistible offers, but if we can do the hard work and make the customer experience and the customer journey well, well worth it, then um, overall you're gonna see just an increase in results, increase in customer base, and overall the lifetime value of a customer is just gonna increase as uh, the effects of trying to conquer all these components or all the verticals that we can't, right? The reason why Amazon's so great is because they cover a lot of verticals. Well, we think like that in terms of our, the e-com brand, and the brand owner itself, then we're able to increase the results, the likelihood, and overall take a brand that's doing five figures a month to then six figures a month, right? So those uh, minute details in terms of increasing the average order value, getting people to purchase from reoccurring buyers, right? Having a subscription model, following these sectors, increasing shipping times, guarantees, irresistible offers, right? These are all a factor that can get us and propel an e-com brand to the next step, right? Just following the components and the verticals that we can cover and change, right? So um, the next step is omnipresent channels. So for smaller brands, it doesn't make sense for them to have an omnipresence if they don't have any market validation or if they're not getting consistent results from a specific platform. This is where you have to focus on one specific platform, master it, and then from there you can pivot since you have more revenue, more capital to then go after more channels to outcompete your competitors, right? But for the bigger budgets in terms of brands that are doing like 
I don't know, 200 K in rev a month, right? They need to hit their customer base on all channels. So what we rule out for our clients is like, depending on where they're at, we focus on TikTok first. And then from there, we help them pivot into the value ladder, right? And helping them conquer, I don't know, Facebook, Snapchat, other, other variables that are needed to increase the revenue of a brand, right? So in terms of what you can do is like you get top of funnel leads for dirt cheap via TikTok, have consistent revenue on TikTok, and then from there retarget those buyers who didn't purchase on TikTok via Facebook ads because the targeting is very more detailed on Facebook compared to TikTok. TikTok's very broad, but you can get, like I mentioned before, top of funnel leads for dirt cheap. Especially after iOS updates, you cannot just rely on one single ad channel. I'm sure like a lot of people were just focusing, having most of their revenue from Facebook and the iOS updates happened. And that just shifted the whole entire market. A lot of people saw a decrease in ROAS, higher cost per, or higher CPMs, higher CPAs. And then from there, they just caught stuck because they just relied on one channel, right? Compared to if you diversify your traffic, let's say for whatever reason, let's say TikTok in the next year or so gets saturated. Well, you've already built up your customer base on TikTok. You've already built up your customer base on Facebook. It's a win-win in both scenarios, right? Lastly, it all comes down to how good your product is, right? I've worked with smaller brands before and they thought my team could just overall solve all their problems, right? When I tell every client this, ads only enhance the current result or the current base of the product, right? If a product doesn't solve a problem, it's very difficult to scale. This is why I really covered market validation and not going after trending products, right? Providing utility. So a lot of these small brand owners don't really have the market validation to scale and to really get results, right? Because it's more so of a trending product or a seasonal product, right? And it's very difficult to scale. But on the other end, working with brands that have an established uh, revenue and they're doing high figures, right? Well, we already know if they're doing high uh, figures, that's mainly because they have market validation. They already have a product that provides utility. So it's for easier for us to come in and even just increase the results that they already have. Because as mentioned before, ads only enhance where a brand is at. This is where when we're working with bigger brands, it's easier for us to get better results because A, we have the budget and B, we already know there's market validation compared to smaller brands, right? Smaller ticket brands where it's like very difficult to scale because we don't have market validation. We don't have these moving components. So um, I, I see a lot of brand owners get mad at agency owners and I see like the downside of it because yeah, maybe agency owners didn't take care of them, but also you have to understand that not every e-com brand owner can be successful. This game is very competitive and ads only enhance your current customer base and the results you've gotten in the past, right? So you can't just solely rely on, on ads. Even at some points, I just recommend growing organic based across TikTok or other short form platforms. And then from there, once you have a stas- establishment, then you can launch ads, right? But it just, it depends, it varies. It's always worth a test, right? To see, okay, what didn't work out? Could it be the creatives? Could it be the product? Could it be the, the niche we're targeting, right? But ideally for bigger brands, right? When we work with those well clients um, in terms of results it's easier for us to go in and amplify their current customer base on tiktok because they already have a proven method and they already have a product that works if that makes sense right so overall that's just at a high value that's what um, i look for in terms of working with econ brands and based on the economy what's happening right now is you're going to see a divide right you're going to see a shift between the separation gap between an established econ brand that's doing high figures, what makes them even stick out and increase the volume of that. And also you have the other side of the spectrum where you have smaller brands where they're not going to survive this next two years because the way the economy is going, it's just going to reset everything and really drive into the point of winners versus losers, right? So if you're an econ brand owner, I suggest having products that provide utility that are here to stay compared to training products because those are what's going to survive over this next two year cycle, right? Where everything's going down, people are um, pulling back their spend and more so just looking for self-sufficient needs for their own likelihood in terms of family, food, and um, transportation, right? Just every like essential human need, that's what they're gonna go after, right? In terms of pulling back spend. So um, if you're econ brand owner, right? This is not to scare you. I would just say, be prepared, be ready to pivot. And now the great thing is with everything pulling back, you're going to have less marketers on each on these platforms. So CPMs are going to decrease as a result from that. And then also you're just going to see the survival in terms of the smaller brands are going to get wiped out. The bigger brands are just going to grow even richer from this because as mentioned before, CPMs are just going to slowly decrease because there's going to be less 
um, ad spend in the market because there's going to be people struggling and there's going to be people really thriving, and killing it. So I uh, hope that gave you some insight in terms of plugging in my resources, right? If you want to go and book a call, if you're an e-com brand owner, you need help scaling, right? You can just go in, you can book in a call right here, or I'll link it down below in this YouTube um, description where you can go and talk directly to me. We can see what we can do to help you pivot from Facebook and diversified traffic onto the TikTok platform. Also, if you're looking to, if you need training or PDFs, you can check out my Facebook group. I cover everything TikTok on there in terms of UGC content creation, how we go about like case studies with clients, some recent results we got, and just to overall help somebody who's on Facebook pivot to TikTok and diversify traffic that way. So I hope you enjoyed this piece of content and uh, look at, looking forward to uh, showing you guys some more concepts in the next one. So thank you. Bye-bye.